All right, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out today. I'd like to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Tony Simmons. Um, Dr. Simmons is a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine section on cardiology, and his specialty training is in cardiac electrophysiology. Um, as such, he serves as the director of the heart station and tachyarrhythmia device therapy, as well as director of cardiac pacing here at Wake Forest. Um, just a little background, he obtained his Bachelor in Science from Rose Polytechnic Institute in Terre Haute, Indiana, uh, followed by his medical degree from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, completed residency in internal medicine and fellowship in cardiology at Mount Sinai Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio, followed by uh, another fellowship in cardiac electrophysiology and pacing at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, also in Cleveland, Clinic, uh, Cleveland Ohio. Um, within Dr. Simmons' rather prolific career as a researcher, um, his major areas of focus are arrhythmias and um, implantable cardiac devices. So on behalf of the Department of Internal Medicine, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Simmons for his talk on exercise and the heart. The uh, screen just went blank here. Is that a problem? <laughs> uh, okay, there you go. All right, good. Okay, just to clarify, although Dr. Beatty is now the director of the pacing. Okay, yeah, so I sort of gave that up a couple of years ago. Well, I'm, I'm sure you guys have all seen this slide multiple times, uh, but when Ruth called me a few days ago and told me that Dr. Rosenthal wanted to, need to keep this talk down to 30 minutes, I thought he must know something about my history of uh, making slides, and so I cut it down from 167 slides, which I had in my carousel, I want carousel, that's an old name, then to my uh, 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 PowerPoint presentation, so we are, we are going to be a lot shorter, but it'll have to move quickly. I don't have any financial disclosures, but let me say that Dr. Paul Thompson was here in October and gave talks at the Bill Little Symposium and he was spectacular. And he is a real pioneer in the whole science of exercise and physiology. And he uh, really opened my eyes to a number of different areas and gave me a bunch of slides. So I didn't steal them, he gave them to me. So what is an athlete? One who participates in an organized team or sport that requires regular competition against others as a central component. I don't think anybody would have a problem recognizing this woman as an athlete. Okay. Some people might have trouble recognizing this gentleman as an athlete. Did I go blank again for some reason? Might depend on your political preferences whether you recognize Arnold as a uh, as an athlete or not. I guess, but clearly they are both athletes. But there's isotonic dynamic change in muscle length as an exercise, and there's isometric, which is static muscle length changes. And they do create different kinds of adaptations on the heart. Isotonic training causes increase in venous return, and there's a chronic volume load. And we end up with dilated ventricular cavities. Isometric training results in increased systolic blood pressure, increased chronic pressure loads, and concentric hypertrophy with normal cavity dimensions. Endurance-trained athletes tend to have LV diameter increases with cardiac output increases up to 40 liters a minute. That's increased afterload is the stimulus for the increased wall thickness, therefore pressure and volume. Whereas strength training increases LV wall thickness, afterload can exceed 300 millimeters of mercury. With a slight increase in the LV wall thickness, 60% of athletes have greater than 11 millimeters. We're going to have to go a little quickly through some of these because there's some stuff at the, uh, in the middle I really want to get to. This is an example of an endurance athlete, and you can see that the cavities are somewhat dilated. This right ventricle is somewhat dilated compared to a normal person, and we're going to go into that in the middle in a few minutes, whereas this guy has he's a, uh, a normal size uh, thickness and wall thickness. There's a lot of EKG abnormalities that occur in athletes. Uh, some of them are distinctly abnormal, some mildly abnormal, some we just don't understand. It's interesting that cycling, cross-country skiing um, have, have the most EKG abnormalities, basketball. Um, 2018, 2017, new criteria came out for interpreting the EKGs of 
young people who engage in athletic activities. So there are now new normals that have been published. There have also been new normals published for people of African American descent, Caribbean descent that we now recognize as normal variants. And that is a topic for another talk, but that is very interesting, maybe a small group talk to go over all the new changes in EKG abnormalities that are now normal. So the incidence of sudden death in athletes is really not well known. We don't always get to know about the people in Winston-Salem marathon or a half marathon that have a problem. We only see the real spectacular ones. But the estimates are one in 200,000 athletes, one in 15,000 joggers, one in 50,000 marathon runners. There have been quite a few deaths at the Marine Corps Marathon. The sport that's engaged in at the time of the sudden death is predominantly basketball and football, surprisingly. So the question is, does exercise hurt the heart? So we're going to play a little sports trivia just for fun. So who is this guy? That's right. He died, he left the NCAA in scoring and rebounding. He died on national TV with an AED at the, at the court side. Interestingly, the AED was there at the court side and they didn't actually use it until they caught a card out, took him off the floor, took him into the locker room, and finally somebody hooked him up to the AED, but he died at the, uh, at the court. And he ended up having, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And he was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, probably should have been kept from playing basketball, but was prescribed a beta blocker, which he stopped taking because it interfered with his performance. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is probably the most common cause of sudden death in young athletes. Unfortunately, there's a significant overlap in the universe of the athlete's heart and the universe of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there's a significant overlap between what's normal and what's abnormal. And it can be difficult for the uninitiated to really differentiate between these two. So who's this guy? Yeah, Sandra Holyfield, the only four-time world heavyweight champion, the real deal. He was diagnosed as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and required to stopped boxing. He stopped boxing for about three months, had another echo, and his hypertrophic cardiomyopathy had resolved, and he resumed boxing again, and later went on to have the fight with uh, Tyson where he's got his ear bitten off. Okay, so regression of the hypertrophy does occur after about three months of restriction. So the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy of athletes is reversible. How about this guy? That's right. Top scorer and captain of the Boston Celtics. He had syncope playing against the Charlotte Hornets. He was a Boston Celtic, so they took him back to Boston where he was evaluated by a quote unquote dream team of cardiologists and told he had a cardiomyopathy and couldn't play basketball. He pulled his IV out, checked himself out of the hospital AMA and went to the Brigham where he was seen by Dr. Mudge who did a tilt table test and told him he had neurocardiogenic syncope and allowed him to start practicing again and he died on the practice court. Tell you the truth, there's been a lot of lawsuits and I think within the last few months, Mudge finally settled uh, the lawsuit. So he actually had dilated cardiomyopathy, which is a very small percentage of the patients who have sudden cardiac death who die. How about this guy? That's right. He's two-time ACC Player of the Year, first round draft choice. He died June 18th of a drug overdose. And so drug overdoses actually make up of just a very small percentage of the patients who end up having sudden cardiac death. How about this guy? 1970 College Player of the Year, Pistol Pete. This is Pete Maravich. Pete Maravich played high school basketball, college basketball. He was an NBA All-Pro, retired, was playing a pickup game outside a radio station prior to his uh, uh, interview and died suddenly on the court and ended up having a coronary anomaly. This is, this is not his angiogram. I couldn't get his angiogram. 
Uh, but he ended up having a um, no left main coronary artery, and his entire heart was per perfused through his right coronary artery, and his heart was severely dilated at the time of his death. And so coronary anomalies, surprising to me, occupy about 14% of all the sudden cardiac deaths in young people. How about this girl? She was a world record holder in the 800 meters. They had an AED at the pool side when she was in the Olympics. And she has long QT syndrome. And long QT syndrome actually is a very small percentage of patients who actually end up dying from, uh, uh, from exercise. This is one of our patients. This is a 32-year-old. He's an endurance athlete. He ran a marathon, came back to Winston-Salem, and passed out in the parking lot. When he got to the emergency room, he was in this rhythm, which is ventricular tachycardia. And you can think you can see there's AV disassociation. There's a wide QRS tachycardia. His baseline EKG is not completely normal. He has T wave inversions in V1, V2, V3. And his CT scan shows very dilated right ventricle, somewhat thickening of his left ventricle. The thinning of the wall of the right ventricle is pretty difficult to see on this view. This is his MRI at diastole. And again, his right ventricle is very dilated compared to his left ventricle. And that's diastole. And this is systole. And on systole, he has all these invaginations and aneurysmal dilatation of his right ventricle. And this is his map in the EP lab of where the tachycardia is coming from. This is his right ventricle. So this BT was coming from the right ventricular outflow tract. And he got an ablation around that area for his VT, but ended up getting an ICD for his VT and his right ventricular dysplasia. And right ventricular dysplasia only accounts for about 3% of sudden deaths in athletes. This is another one of our patients. He's a 28-year-old professional cyclist. Best finish was 36 in a Tour de France, which may not seem like a lot, but it's probably pretty doggone good. Uh, he was actually on U.S. Postal with Lance Armstrong. I don't know. Am I doing something wrong here? Or uh, There we go. But anyway, he had palpitations during a race, and he was suspended until he was cleared. Turns out Winston-Salem, this whole area, is a big hotspot for a professional cyclist. And... Um, hmm. He came here for his uh, uh, evaluation. His EKG is really unremarkable. Maybe the QT is a little on the longish side. We put him on a treadmill, and it became distinctly abnormal. You can see the ST elevation in V1, these long bifid T waves that occurred. His QT actually got longer instead of shorter. So we did an isoprel infusion. We started the isoprel, and he started having all these PVCs. And then he started having polymorphic ventricular tachycardia during the isoprel infusion. So he had an abnormal signal average EKG, an abnormal stress test, a very abnormal isoprel infusion, symptoms during erasing. We strongly recommended an ICD and no competitive athletes. He was a chemical engineer. He had two kids. He said, okay, okay. Went back to France and died on a training run. He actually went into VT called his wife, said things are going bad, but died before anybody got there. Not sure where exactly to put him. He is certainly a channelopathy, a catecholaminergic ventricular tachyarrhythmia, and he doesn't really fit on this pie chart. How about this guy? I doubt you're going to know him. He was a 20-game, unless you're a baseball fan. He's a 20-game winner for the Cardinals. He lost two games against the Mets. He died in 2002 with premature coronary artery disease. So if you're over the age of 35, how many people in this room are over the age of 35? <laughs> if you're over the age of 35, as far as the ACC, American College of Sports Medicine, you are a middle-aged athlete. Okay? So if you're a middle-aged athlete, the most common cause of death is coronary artery disease, second hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, aortic stenosis. So are we missing the ball? Does exercise actually hurt your heart? 
are there deleterious cardiac effects for acute and chronic endurance athletes, okay? This is the curve we'd like to believe is, exists, okay? So that at very low exercise, you have a relatively high risk of cardiovascular events. And with any kind of exercise, going down to a virtual zero asthmatope, you get benefit as far as cardiovascular events and longevity with exercise. This is what we'd like to believe. This is what the data actually shows. These are composite of a number of different studies, and it's actually a J-shaped curve. So there's significant benefit in the beginning. It flattens those out, and then it's starting to go back up again where there are actually more deaths with more endurance athletes. So this is the extreme exercise hypothesis. So this is the most benefit from exercise. This is the current guidelines for exercise based on the CDC and the American Heart Association for our patients. So how do you get to the most benefit without going over the line? For a long time, people were very concerned about the fact that runners have elevated CKs and their CKMVs were elevated, indicating that maybe there was ongoing myocardial damage related to the CKMV. And you can see with these runners, they pre-race to the post-race, there were significant increases in your CKMV, and the faster you ran, the more CKMV you got. Turns out this was a red herring. Runners are constantly injuring subskeletal muscles, which is repaired using satellite cells. Satellite cells are pluripotential. They make all kinds of CK, including CKMB. So CKMB and CK were not a marker of cardiac damage. Interestingly, back as far as 1990, there was a paper that did show with 2D echo, which back in 1990 was pretty primitive, uh, that they were after exercise, left ventricular, left and right atrial sizes actually got smaller, but right ventricular size actually increased with significant exercise. This is a more recent paper where they looked at 40 athletes pre and one week post with races of three to 11 hours in duration. During that time, the RV volume increased, left ventricular volume decreased, BNP and troponin were correlated with decreased right ventricular ejection fraction. And right ventricular ejection fraction decreased with event duration and individual V.02. This is an MRI showing these patients, and you can see this is a, supposedly a relatively normal of the, you know, before exercise, but I think his RV is still somewhat dilated. But look at this guy after his exercise. Look how baggy and dilated his right ventricle is. And this one here. But in addition, they use gadolinium, and there's actually staining of the gadolinium inside the myocardium, in some cases all the way around the myocardium, which indicates fibrosis, edema, and damage to the right ventricle and left ventricle with endurance athletes. What does that mean for these people long term? Are they going to end up with diastolic dysfunction due to restriction of their ventricle? Uh, I don't think it's really, this is, a, this is a very new science. We don't know what's going to happen to these people who are now endurance athletes running 100 mile races. So why is the RV most affected? The RV wall stress is lower at rest with a lower PA pressure. But the increase in pulmonary artery pressure is relatively greater than the increase in the systemic blood pressure. Vascular resistance decreases only 30 to 50 percent in the lungs versus 75 percent decrease in vascular resistance when you exercise systemically. And the pulmonary circuit is not trainable. You can't get better results with more exercise. So the greater increase in RV wall stress, which is 125 versus 24 percent, is imposed on a very thin right ventricular wall. This was an interesting paper where they looked at coronary artery plaque volume among male marathon runners. Now, these are kind of obsessive compulsive runners, if you ask me. Um, they, uh, as, as a runner, I still don't do a marathon every year for the last 25 years, okay? 
And they looked at these men and compared them to 23 controls, and they did high-resolution coronary angiography, uh, CT angiography. I don't know we could get that through our IRB now, doing CT angiograms on uh, control patients. But what they found was that the total plaque volume in the runners was substantially greater than in the controls that there was significant increase in calcified plaque volume with a very, very significant p-value. And there was a, still a significant increase in the non-calcified plaque volume. So this can't be right. I mean, that, that, that can't be right. I mean, I'm an exerciser. I mean, I, I, you just can't tell me that coronary exercise is bad for you, right? So this is another study that was done where they looked at patients that they divided into less than 1,000 met minutes per week, 1,000 to 2,000 met minutes per week, and greater than 2,000 met minutes per week. And they looked at CT angios as well. And what they found was there was a substantial increase in the coronary artery calcification of the endurance runners. All the runners had somewhat increase, but there was substantial increase in the very bad type of coronary artery calcification. They also looked at atherosclerotic plaques. And in the endurance runners, the number of the prevalence of atherosclerotic plaques in their coronary arteries increased with the amount of exercise they did. This can't be right. I mean, this is, I mean, I was going to live to be 100 because I exercise so much. But they're only telling me if I exercise too much, I actually have more coronary artery disease. Well, it turns out, if you go back and you look at it, the majority of these plaques were heavily calcified plaques, okay? Very densely calcified plaques. This was a study where they looked at master's athletes. If you're a master's athlete, if you're over 50, okay? And they took 234 master's athletes versus 200 controls, and they panned them down using a health questionnaire, physical exam. They eliminated people with who had obesity, blood pressure problems, cholesterol problems. They ended up with matched controls of 152 versus 90. And they ended up doing cardiac MRI and CT angiography on these groups. And what they found was coronary calcium score was again elevated in these master's athletes. Shockingly to me is that they looked at the atherosclerotic plaques on these master's athletes, and the number of atherosclerotic plaques was dramatically increased in the athletes and not in the controls. They also looked at the maximal luminal diameter stenosis, and with increasing amounts of exercise, you had increasing amounts of stenosis. They later looked at the type of plaques that they had, and they found that the male athletes predominantly had very heavily calcified plaques, whereas the controls had a mixed soft plaque. Why, why would this happen? One of the reasons may be that running causes turbulence, which actually causes more coronary artery disease, or that running ruptures small plaques, which then heal, and they heal by having more calcium deposition, which creates denser plaques. Exercise may increase parathyroid hormone, which increases calcium. Or that the present risk factors that you're studying these runners today didn't reflect as well as the runners' risk factors before they started running. It's certainly the numbers of patients, the number of runners, the number of people who've been studied is dramatically small. And this is a very, very intensive area of, ex of uh, research right now. This was a study where they looked at patients who had two hours of moderate intensity cycling compared to uh, non-cyclists, and before the exercise, and after the exercise, there was a substantial increase in parathyroid hormone. So is more calcium bad? Well, you know, if you look at calcium volume and you look at your risk factor for development of coronary artery disease, the more calcium volume in your coronary arteries, the worse you are. That's pretty much standard knowledge. 
It turns out if you look at the calcium density scores, the denser the amount of calcium in your coronary arteries, the risk factor actually goes down. So these athletes are developing more plaques, more calcium, but the plaques are very dense and much less likely to rupture, which we now know is the primary cause of an acute MI, is not the gradual closure of an artery, but the rupture of a plaque. So these plaques are less likely to rupture. So they may have more calcium, they may have more coronary artery disease, but they're less likely to have a sudden MI. So, do we stop exercising? <laughs> you know, put on some Jimmy Buffett and have a margarita. I don't know. Uh, no. I mean, if you look at this uh, study, uh, was done in Copenhagen, and they compared sedentary joggers, light joggers, moderate joggers, and strenuous joggers. And this is a hazard plot of all-cause mortality, and so they called the, the non-joggers the, 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 the hazard ratio of one. So the light jogger, significant reduction in all-cause mortality. The moderate jogger, pretty significant decrease. The strenuous jogger just barely made it over the line, but when they adjusted for age, sex, smoking, alcohol intake, the strenuous jogger moved on the wrong side of the line. So exercise up to a strenuous level predicts less cardiovascular mortality, predicts a longer life. This is the curve that we would hope that we would be following. I, I think this is interesting in that if you look at the delta, so if you see, if you have from a patient who doesn't exercise to someone who just does moderate exercise, and this is, I've actually shown my patients this graph and said, look, just give me 10 minutes four times a week and you're gonna decrease your cardiovascular risk you're going to decrease your overall mortality. All I need is 10 minutes three or four times a week. And after that, we'll talk about getting you down farther on this line where we're actually getting you into some moderate exercise and improving your overall risk factors. So moderate activity, brisk walking, bicycling less than 10 miles an hour. 10 miles an hour is practically have to have training wheels because the bike will fall over, right? Water aerobics, tennis, some ballroom dancing. More vigorous activities, which are still acceptable, uphill walking, bicycling, running or jogging at a lower speed for shorter periods of time, tennis. Back to our test. Most of these people I would expect you to know. How about the guy on the left here? Larry Legend, Larry Bird. Billie Jean King, Jerry West. How about this guy? You have to be old to know this guy. Bradley. Bill Bradley, yeah, yeah. This guy is a Tour de France rider whose name starts with a Z. He's best he's ever finished his fourth, but, and I, I just can't say his name. Uh, he's a Spanish rider. What do these guys all have in common? They all have atrial fibrillation. And they've all had atrial fibrillation ablations, okay? So what about atrial fibrillation in your heart? Is AFib more common in endurance athletes? It turns out that exercise intensity, going from none to low and to moderate to high, is again a J-shaped curve. So the more exercise you do, the less likely you are to have AFib until you cross a line of being into very vigorous physical activity, and then you actually end up with more atrial fibrillation. This was just a composite study where they looked at various groups. Uh, this is a 65% um, increase. This was a, uh, a group of cyclists. They had a 10% increase in atrial fib versus controls, much more significant than you'd expect in a healthy group of people. This was a great study, though. Uh, this was a fitness study in people with uh, uh, obesity and diabetes and had atrial fibrillation. And what they looked at was, okay, let's look at this one here. So if you have, if you, the more exercise you do, if you get into a regular exercise program, you have greater freedom from atrial fibrillation. Turns out moderate exercise can actually help treat atrial fibrillation. That's the good news. The bad news is if you are exercise too much, like these skiers from, um, I forget whether that's 
Copenhagen. The more races you did, the more AFib you had. The faster you went, the more AFib you had. So why do people who exercise get AFib? Well, one reason may be increased parasympathetic tone. As you exercise more, your heart rate goes down. That allows you to have more PACs, more short runs of PACs, which is the trigger for atrial fibrillation. One might be increased sympathetic tone with the exertion. It's like doing an uncontrolled stress test. You get overwhelming amount of uh, catecholamines, which puts stress on the left atrium and the right atrium. The stretch causes more arrhythmias, causes more atrial fibrillation. There could be chronic atrial enlargement, just like there's chronic right ventricular enlargement in people who do excessive exercise. You can get chronic right atrial enlargement. And there's been some studies with C, CK, uh, with, uh, uh, who show uh, increased inflammation markers on the bloodstream. This was a study where they looked at elite athletes, and a significant portion of both men and women had dilated left atrium at rest. This guy's my hero. Um, I love his T-shirt. He's he's outgoing. He's going for a, he's going for a jog. He's 50. He's fat. He's diabetic, and he's ahead of you. So I want this guy as a patient. <laughs> All right, I want, this, is my, this is my ideal patient. Now, I'm not going to be behind him for very long, but I still like him, okay? I stole this quote from um, a Mayo Clinic Proceedings, and they attributed it to Hippocrates 2,000 years ago, which said, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little, not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. So I can stop here because I'm into 34 minutes and I was told 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, I've got about five more slides if you want me to go through those. Okay, all right. So how do we screen young athletes then? Well, one of the ways that is a reasonable strategy and I think all Division I athletes get is like history and physical. There's a 14-point history and physical that's been, uh, been well documented, ECGs. That's a controversial point. The problem with ECG is that they are too sensitive, and we did not know how to read them in young athletic people. With the new criteria that have come out in 2018, 2017, the thinking is that there will be less false positives, less MRIs, less echoes, and more people passed on to do regular exercise. We would only do an echocardiogram in a young person if we really found something during the physical or in their history. If you're a middle-aged athlete or a wannabe athlete, that means you're over 35 and you're sedentary, okay, you can take a, a questionnaire which is like the Framingham risk assessment. There's one on the American College of Sports Medicine. There's one on the ACC that's a personal assessment questionnaire. But you probably also need to get a physical exam, a heart murmur, sitting and squatting. Why sitting and squatting? Looking for IHSS, okay? Uh, femoral pulses, stigmata of Marfan's, blood pressure, just regular things. Can I go too far here? So if you're greater than 35, okay. We would only do an exercise test on somebody between 35 and 50 if they had hypercholesterol, hy I'm sorry, diabetes, history of coronary artery disease in a young person, symptoms suggestive of coronary artery disease, or if you're actually over 65. If you're a sedentary adult senior, that means you're over 50 years of age, and you don't do anything but you want to start an exercise program, and it's going to be a low-intensity exercise program, then doing the questionnaire, and if it's really pretty negative, I think it's very safe to allow those people to go ahead and do low-intensity exercise. If they do the questionnaire and it's a positive, they've got a strong family history, they've got chest pain, they've got elevated blood pressure, they've got diabetes, they probably need to be seen by a physician. And if it's really negative, they're good for, for low-intensity exercise. 
But if it's positive, they're going to need stress testing. If you get a 55-year-old guy come into your clinic who sits in front of a computer desk all the time and wants to do his first marathon with his granddaughter, he needs a workup. He's going to have to have this questionnaire. He's going to have to have a history, physical, an EKG. And if it's negative, probably is okay to start this exercise program. But if it's positive, he's going to need an exercise test. If two of the three things on the questionnaire are positive, he needs an exercise test. <coughs> if it's an active senior, it's pretty much the same. You, you know, low level, we really don't need to do much. If it's, you're asking to be moderate, probably really don't need to do much. But if they're at, even if they're an active senior and they want to do their first marathon, they probably need a workup. All right, so the bottom line is exercise is good. Extreme exercise, not so much. That's all I got. Thanks. <laughs> Anybody ask any questions? Thank you. I, I had two questions. First of all, I, I felt there was a lot of bias there, and I, I think to counter it, the next uh, grand round should be about work and its effect on the heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but seriously, so for like my dialysis patients or patients I have that are ill, uh, you know, have chronic medical conditions, I try to get them to walk. Um, but do you have any suggestions on that? Because we're trying to get these patients to do some exercise, but I'm always worried about the cardiac risk. You know, what I, what I actually, act, what I really try to get my patients to do is I tell them, don't worry about how far you're going. Don't worry about what you're doing. Just do something continuously for 10 minutes, okay? You don't have to get short of breath. What, this, what that data really does suggest is you don't have to feel pain to get benefit. So if you just go for a slight, go for a walk, get on a recumbent bike for 10 minutes and do that for two or three weeks, and then come back and talk to me. And then we'll talk about other goals. But the goal is, first of all, get that first delta. And that first delta is virtually no exercise. It just means 10 or 15 minutes of gentle walking, gentle turning of the wheels, Get on your elliptical and just let the pedal turn for 10 or 15 minutes. Thanks. Hi, Ben Intriguing. Thanks for the talk. The question that I had, I think you alluded to it a little bit, was the role of inflammation. Among the extreme you know, people that do extreme exercises, do we have as a, in a multivariate analysis the use of aspirin or other anti-inflammatory drugs and what the effect would have to that? I do not. I do not know anything on that. I think there's a, this, this area is actually a recognition that there is um, a problem is actually relatively new. Okay? So I think there's a lot of areas. First of all, all the slides I showed you were men. Okay? What about women? What about cycling versus running? What about weightlifting? I, I, I don't know. I don't think there's any real data. Uh, but go ahead. Then. Yeah, just I want to allude to an experiment that was done. Um, you know, they got a slight cyclist, and they use a tourniquet first, then temperature, and they compare one limb to another. One limb with uh, low temperature, the other limb, you know, just cycling with a low temperature. And the hypertrophy was much higher in the limb that was, you know, without low temperature. And the hypertrophy was much less in the limb. Uh, uh, that was with, um, you know, low temperature, just something wrapping around it to keep the low temperature through the exercise. And pain was less, as expected, in the limb that was with the, you know, um, uh, the cold. But the perfusion actually was better in the cold limb. And, uh, you know, the only explanation they come up with is that them, because we expect vasoconstriction, but the amount of, uh, you know, cytokines in the limb that was with the cold probably counteract that vasoconstriction and improve the velocity perfusion. Just, you know, an, an example well, Why of, would it be better than in the other leg? It should be a least, Why would it be better? Why wouldn't it be the same? I don't understand. So you would expect that by putting the cold... Um, to get vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction, but the perfusion was actually better in that limb because 
you know, the amount of uh, cytokines or inflammatory components was expected to be less. They, they didn't measure cytokines from one limb to another, but that was the hypothesis. So that's what I was expect, you know, asking about, you know, if, if you suppress uh, inflammation with an anti-inflammatory, what's easily to be done with aspirin, what would be the effect of that? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear anything about uh, electrolyte disturbances or anything along that line. <laughs> Uh, I didn't actually read anything about anybody studying them in, in these hype, in these marathon runners, but certainly, you know, uh, we know, uh, like the Maryland football player died suddenly. Uh, uh, I did not read anybody of any of the patients who had the sudden death where they actually looked at something that was an electrolyte disturbance. I would not be surprised, but I did not see anything. Um, going back to Hippocrates, uh -huh. the right amount of nourishment and right amount of exercise. Is there any data on how diet modifies this relationship that you have described? I, I think there's absolutely zero data. That's why I say I think any project that you could come up with that you could get through an IRB would probably be very interesting. I mean, I mean these studies are not real hard science, are they? You know. I took 41 runners and I looked at their CT scans. Uh, I took 200, you know, leisure activity runners and compared it to my controlled. I mean, these are not these are not high power science. So I think you could almost postulate anything and it would be publishable. Oh, um, so it seems lately there's a trend for children to start exercising younger, and a lot of sports are now kind of year long and much more intense than they were in the future. Do you foresee that we might have more issues with this in the future? I cannot imagine that, you, that we won't. I mean, just from this little smattering of data, we don't know what's going to happen to all those runners that had all that gadolinium in their myocardium. What's going to happen to them five years from now, 10 years from now? If you start at that age with extreme exercise and you push it all the way up to when they're in high school, I got to imagine you're going to see a lot of patients with RV dysplasia, uh, RV dysfunction, uh, diastolic dysfunction, uh, dilated atriums. I, I just, um, I am suspicious. Certainly nobody's done it. Tony, thank you for a wonderful grand round. I just wanted to make two comments. One uh, historical one, uh, Jerry Morris, epidemiologist in uh, London, described the fact that uh, conductors had fewer heart attacks compared to bus drivers. <laughs> and they attributed it to the fact that the conductor was constantly moving up and down collecting uh, the fee for the bus. Mm. The other thing, I just want to remind you that in my youth, you and I ran in uh, uh, Salem Lake, and your previous chairman of cardiology uh, made a bet that if anyone came after me, they would lose their uh, bonus for that year. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true. It's actually not a joke. Uh, he was a little competitive. He was a little competitive. But I beat him. <laughs> not that I'm competitive. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Simmons? Uh, if you, if we're going to have some announcements after for the internal medicine residency program if people want to stick around for that. But I will take any last questions. All right. Make sure to fill out your evaluation forms. Thank you very much. <laughs>